having an impact on the city. The mob had, but the mob was, was no longer the dominant player in the underworld. And the drug underworld was certainly much more violent. And what was going on in the drug underworld was having a greater impact on society in general. So I, I, I spent more time writing about and reporting on that than Cosa Nostra at the end of my career at the Empire. Speaking of that, since you like brought on like about Black and Hispanic, since you have done a lot on the La Costa Nostra, especially the ones that occurred in South Philadelphia during the Philly mob era, have you ever done anything more like on the Black Mafia or some people dispute about the Black Mafia's existence? I, I wrote several stories about the Junior Black Mafia when they they were in play for a while. Um, but separate and apart from that, I mean, the major stories I did at the end of my career were about a drug dealer in North Philly named Cabani Savage, mm -hmm. probably more violent than any mob boss I ever wrote about, and a really entrepreneurial uh, drug operator in Southwest Philly named Alton Coles, nicknamed Ace Capone. And he had a major cocaine and crack network. And um, writing about those guys was not unlike writing about uh, Angelo Bruno and Nicky Scarfer in their heyday. Um, it was, it, what I found in writing about it was neither law enforcement nor the public um, had the same perception of who those guys were, as opposed, everybody knew who Angelo Bruno was. Everybody knew who Nicky Scarpo was. Writing about Alton Coles, writing about Cabani Savage, it was like uh, I was introducing those characters to the public. Uh, mm. and if, if you get the point I'm making, is it, we, we, tend, we tended to overlook major players in the underworld. And I wondered if that was systemic racism on our part or just it was much easier. Everybody had a frame of reference when you're talking about the mafia. Everybody has a, you know, they know the movies. They know, they know all the backstory. This, these were drug gangs. So if you look, Alton Coles, Cabani Savage, tremendous impact on the city, a lot of violence. Um, and they didn't get the, the attention, the consistent attention that the mafia did. Understood. Yeah. And, um, and I might get back on that subject a little bit, but since you mentioned Angela Bruno, I want to be the precursor to that. Have you ever did um, any stories on the like the so-called first one, Salvatore Sabella? No, I, I mean, that all obviously predated when I was a reporter for the Inquirer. My jumping off point in terms of writing about this was uh, I was a reporter at the Inquirer in the late 1970s. The Inquirer sent me to Atlantic City to cover the, the start of the casino gambling era. And this is 1976. And the debate back then was... Uh, was legalized gaming going to bring the mob to Atlantic City? The, the answer was the mob already was in Atlantic City, but it became part of what I was writing about. And so my jumping off point in terms of writing about organized crime, writing about the Philadelphia crime family, began in the, in the 70s, which was the end of the Bruno era, and then from yeah. there going forward. Didn't do much at all in terms of the, you know, an historic look back at this. Newspapers don't do that very often anyway. Unfortunately, I feel like the new papers are going to the obituaries, but yeah, right. I gotta appreciate because after all, that's how you got your start. You said, I think you meant this because we both came from CCP, and you mentioned that um, what got you into journalism was that your father brought a newspaper every day, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's it's you know it, it, when you're a reporter, you go where the story takes you, and and I was fortunate to work at the Inquirer at a time when we had a lot of resources, we had a big staff. Uh, there was a lot of money and uh, reporters were able to develop beats. I mean, I don't know that anybody could do what we did at the Inquirer in the 70s. Uh, I don't know anybody could do that again today because it, it, people don't realize reporting is labor intensive. Good reporting is labor intensive. And uh, you have to have the luxury of being able to say, nah, the story's not there yet. I need a couple more days. I need another week. Given the way the news cycle is today, it's a 24-7 news cycle, and given the lack of, of staff, the, the diminishing staff, the lack of resources, much more difficult to, to develop uh, a beat and to become as a, some, something of an expert on any, any given topic. Whereas back in, in my day, it was a lot of guys were, were able to develop an expertise in a, in a given field, not just organized crime, you know, politics, um, education, whatever. The, the, you got to be able to take the time to get into it. And you can't do that if you're stretched very thin. And I think, unfortunately, most newspapers, the staff is stretched very thin right now. Understood. 
Now, um, I was just curious because I remember before that you had like disputes about like some of the monikers, like Angelo Bruno being called the docile John or the gentle Don, because I've heard certain different uh, stories. Some say here in the moniker because he didn't whack Antonio Polina, uh, even though that's been like one of the big disputes because I think when Bruno was rising in the criminal underworld, Antonio Polina was trying to get him executed, but instead Bruno caught wind of it and therefore say, okay, let's not kill him because that's going to cause beef within the families. So, I, I, you know, I think Bruno was called the docile Don only because of what came after him. The, you know, the, the Nicky Scarfo, uh, the violence that, that came after Bruno was killed. Bruno was a boss for, for 21 years. Um, people were killed during the Bruno era, but Bruno was also a mafia, mafia diplomat. Bruno recognized that the important thing was make money, not make headlines. So yeah. murder was kind of a negotiating tool of last resort. If everything else failed, somebody might get whacked. Scarfo comes along and, and anybody screws up, they're getting whacked. It changed the whole dynamic. So Bruno became known as the docile Don, I think, almost posthumously because of who came after him in terms of the violence that was let loose after Bruno was killed. Uh, the, the general Don, the docile Don, I think is almost a misnomer. Uh, all these guys, all these mob bosses, use violence as a tool. It's just, it, scrapers to enjoy it. And that was, you know, it was like, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's that kind of thing with Scarpa. Violence was all he knew, and anything that happened, he resorted to violence to resolve the problem. Whereas Bruno would <clears throat> negotiate, Bruno would talk to guys, Bruno would work out compromises. You saw none of that in the Scarpa world. That's why I think Bruno was known as a docile man. And historically, there was situations where you know, um, and at one point, I think a couple guys, uh, he opted not to resort to violence, but to put him on the shelf, so to speak. And and that contributed to his reputation. Have you ever, because I noticed you like did reports on his assassination in front of his house. Have you ever met like any of his relatives or anything that matter? Now, I talked to his, his daughter a couple times, but uh, it was difficult to... She was a difficult person to talk to. Um, nah, I don't, you know, I talked to Bruno casually a couple of times before he was killed, but he, he oh. would never say very much of anything. Oh, wow. You met the man himself. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he was, he was coming out of a hearing and, you know, was kind of a no comment. He was always polite. Uh, some of these other guys would just blow you off. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and check out more content. Feel free to give us your feedback and suggestions on who we should do next in the comments. This is Infinitely Productions. We love you.